The big questions confronting Michigan football post spring. We'll get into those next right here on Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Clark. Waits for it. Tim Clark. This is no time for that. In the pocket and a sack. Tim Jamison. Brady gets terrific. Throws it. And a touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got him. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Kohler at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. On his way. It's good. He's 5'7", 179 pounds. A junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop. And he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play. Pressure coming. Second. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Robinson and Michigan. Winner. We're going to win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be Michigan again. Michigan. Go Blue. I'm Steve Dace. Welcome to this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. Later on, our good friend, the voice of college football, Mark Rogers, will be joining us and we'll take a look at questions confronting the Big Ten as a whole coming out of spring ball. But let's focus first and foremost on the Wolverines, the maize and blue. I, I think coming out of spring football, there are five key questions confronting the program over the next few months before fall practice begins. Let's begin with number one. Is the starting quarterback not on campus yet? I'm going to go on record. I know what Matt Weiss, Michigan's new quarterback's coach, I guess. We don't really know what, what's going on there. Not really sure Jim Harbaugh does, frankly. <laughs> All right. But uh, I, I'm not convinced the starting quarterback is on campus yet. I know Matt Weiss said that, uh, you know, hey, Cade McNamara is our starter. I'm on record. I'm belie- I believe Alan Bowman is starting the first game. Why? Because I've seen Alan Bowman and Cade McNamara play. That's why I believe that. And one of these things is not like the other. Not I'm not I'm not saying that Alan Bowman is Justin Fields coming in as a transfer, uh, but I think he's actually more physically gifted than Jake Rudock was. Uh, and you saw how he took off in Harbaugh's first year. We're talking about a guy that has over five thousand yards passing in his college career, and that's in the Power Five conference. So I think Alan Bowman will be your starting quarterback. There's me answering the question, but he still has to come in, you know, really prove himself with teammates and things of that nature. But in in terms of capability and resume, I, I really don't think it's close between Cade McNamara and Alan Bowman. So I don't believe the starting quarterback is on campus yet. Bowman arrives in June. But hey, you could also be concerned. What happens if you go with a guy that wasn't there all offseason? It's not like Michigan has uh, any more need for culture problems, which brings us to question number two. Was the culture fixed? The the culture for your team is built in the spring. When you get into the summertime, a lot of it then is the success of your offseason program is predicated on that culture. Uh, Those players have to police themselves. Those internal leaders take over from there during the non-supervisory period. Then you get into fall practice, man, and it's, it's just all about getting ready for the season at hand. The spring is where culture is formed. 
or at the very least, you take a big step towards forming that culture. Clearly, the culture at Michigan is broken. Uh, you look at the fact Michigan is eighth in the most transfers in the Power Five, and a lot of the teams ahead of us over the last few years uh, had coaching changes, which explains the number one reason that players transfer. New staffs come in, have a different evaluation of players, and so players move on. Uh, we didn't have that issue. Uh, our guys just don't stay. Our, our guys sit out bull games. Uh, our guys are marginal college players who worry about their future pro prospects. I mean, the culture at Michigan is broken. Is it irredeemably so? We're going to get the answer to that this fall. And, and, and we're going to get the answer to that this fall. But that question is really being answered right now. Speaking of the transfer portal, that brings us to question number three. How many more players are going to hit the transfer portal? I mean, you're looking over 60 Wolverines have gone into the transfer portal uh, in the last few years. It's funny. Michigan basketball is one of only three programs in the entire sport that doesn't have a single player in the transfer portal right now. Michigan football is transfer portal U. And it's like the Hotel California, man. The door only seems to swing right now one way. How many more players now that there's been a sifting post-spring? You find out where you stand. Now you've got a clear picture of new defensive coordinator Mike McDonald's scheme and whether you fit in that scheme and, uh, and or you don't, or you fit into Don Brown, his predecessor scheme, and not this one. Like, I don't get the William Apache Mohan thing. I know he was brought in as a viper. Maybe it's just me, but did, did you all watch us play defense last year? I, I got to think there's there's a place on a roster – for a guy who's 6'2", 215, and runs a 4'5". He can't play safety. Have you seen some of our safeties get blown up uh, and, and, and you know on the back end of the defense the last few years? I, I, I got to think there's a place for a guy like that, but he's totes out, you know, uh, poured one out for him. So we'll be, there'll be some other players that are going to say, eh, this isn't for me, I don't fit in here. So how many more players hit the transfer portal for the Wolverines? That's another thing, a big question, confronting Jim Harbaugh and the program now coming out of the spring. Fourth on our list of questions to consider, how steep is the learning curve with all the new coaches? I mean, a lot of the teaching, not just a lot of the culture, is what gets terraformed in the spring, but a lot of the teaching, it goes on this time of year as well. Well, now let's see. We've got a rookie assistant coach uh, who is now coaching a position he didn't play. Uh, We've got a a, a rookie defensive coordinator who's never called a defense. We've got a rookie co-offensive coordinator uh, who's also a rookie offensive line coach. Are you seeing a trend? We have a rookie quarterbacks coach. Okay. Um, so, uh, and and our running backs coach, whom we love because he's our leading all-time rusher, Mike Hart, once publicly condemned his head coach when he was at another school, and this is his first year here. So, I mean, it's just like, uh, I hope we roll Yahtzee. You know, but it's not just the players that are, are, are you know, you're learning uh, with in, in such a young team this year, but it's also a coaching staff as well. So how steep is that learning curve? We are going to find out in just a few months. And then finally, um, how big of an advantage did Michigan gain over every other college football team that televised a spring game? When we beat Bama now, this was actually a line of thought of some people I saw on social media that Michigan has gained a strategic advantage by not televising a spring game. Some of y'all are just too dumb to live. A big thank you to our Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash Michigan podcast because you make these episodes possible with your support. And we get asked all the time, hey, we love what you guys do. How can we support you? Well, for just $5 a month, you can support us at patreon.com slash Michigan podcast. And hey, college basketball may be done, but now we're into the Major League Baseball handicapping. And we had an outstanding season in Major League Baseball last year. We had a pretty good season in college basketball this year as well, as you can see right there from something we recently posted on our Patreon page. So five $5 a month to get 
some pretty good sports handicapping and opportunity to win some money, like when we recommended you take before the tournament, Baylor 6-1 to one to win the national championship. You saw that thing pay off, right? Well, your $5 a month pays off when you support us at patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast. Time now for the 10-minute war, and for that, we bring in our good friend and the perhaps one and only reasonable Ohio State fan, uh, that is Mark Rogers, who has a spectacular college football page as well, right here on YouTube, the voice of college football. Good to see you, Mark. How you been, brother? Good to see you, Steve. Uh, I enjoyed that Michigan spring game. So did the rest of us. I mean, I, I'm ecstatic that it wasn't on. I mean, I think it's dumb. I think it's stupid. Don't get me wrong. I mean, and the idea that there is some competitive advantage, I guess we're beating Bama this year because they put theirs on, right? I mean, it's just, it's just dumb. But I looked at it as an act of mercy, Mark. You know, I, I thought this was one of the, maybe the only time ever that the pusher comes to you as the junkie and says, uh, you just, I, I can't sell you anymore. And, and so I just, I felt like we were getting put out of our misery that the program was just like, we, we, we've we lied to you the last five off seasons. We can't do that this year. And so the only way to, to, to play the, to win the game is not to play, deny the fire ex oxygen, show you no spring whatsoever, no delusions of grandeur, let alone adequacy and enjoy your, uh, enjoy your spring and summer. Uh, and you can wait until September before we uh, curb stomp your stroke. Your thoughts on that, Mark? Well, I don't really think it much matters. Uh, I think all the spring games are pretty ugly. I get uh, hyped up. I get a bit duped by just missing college football so much that I say, oh, wow, the Clemson spring game's on today. And then I watch three or four plays and realize it's a glorified scrimmage, if that. And it's really not made for the consumer. It's made for the coaches to, to make their evaluations and develop players. And they just happen to invite the TV cameras for that one particular scrimmage. So it is what it is. And if you watch the Ohio State one, it's even less football because they don't even tackle. Which, again, is for viewing purposes awful. But for their intent, it's for them. It's not for the consumer. Remember how terrible Justin Fields was at the Ohio State spring game his first year? Four for 13. Yeah, then he went out in the fall and he threw, what was it, 40 touchdowns and one interception or something? (laughs) I mean, it's just... Okay, moving on. Uh, So, um, what are your thoughts uh, on some some of what I shared at the top, I want to get your take on on not just Michigan, but uh, the Big Ten post spring collectively. So I shared what I thought were some of the big questions uh, surrounding Michigan football coming out of the spring. I mean, what are some of the questions that you have, and maybe they're the same ones. Let's go Michigan first. Okay, J.J. McCarthy, I know that he's not the starter, and I'm a bit surprised that Jim Harbaugh said that Cade McNamara is the starter. Now it was Matt Weiss, just... the new quote unquote quarterbacks okay. coach. Who said that? Not Harbaugh, but I hear you. Okay. Yeah. That anybody would be named the starter. But again, I don't think it's a big deal. Now, we know that great players are made when nobody's watching. So what is J.J. McCarthy in particular going to do between now and the beginning of August camp? We know that he's going to work out. He's going to do all the things that are expected of him. But is he really going to press toward this job? Is he going to be asking those questions of the coaches. Is he going to build relationships with the receivers in particular and the offensive line? Is he going to work extra with them? Is he going to do all the things and really study the playbook and the the tape to get better? Uh, Is the coaching staff that we know is unfamiliar with each other, unfamiliar with their roles? We know that coaches grind. That's what they do. But are they going to grind in a different way, in a smart way. There's working and there's working smart. Are they going to build that cohesiveness as a staff to be better as a unit than they would would have been in the spring, which there couldn't be much expected of them as a coaching staff, as a unit, because of all the the unfamiliar phases in different places. Uh, So what are they going to do? Uh, Again, I'm weighing the defense in my mind, the scheme that could be improved under Mike McDonald versus what we had under Don Brown versus quality competition versus the losses, McGrone and Pay, and let's see, Carlo Kemp. And I, I don't see where the personnel is going to be better, but maybe with the scheme adjustments and Mike McDonald being 
uh, better schematically. Maybe they're better on defense. And again, we've talked this uh, a number of times, Steve. I bring it up. Game changer on offense. Ronnie Bell's really good. I, I love Ronnie Bell. Productive number one receiver, but not a game changer. And I know that we've talked about it and you bring up uh, guys that are supposed to be that guy, but I still have to see it. And Xavier Worthy said goodbye, and he was the best candidate to be that guy. What's What I think is going to be important about this season from a fan perspective is when you look at the roster, there are, and you and I have talked about this in the past, there, there, it, there is a litany of highly recruited players on this roster that have not done anything yet in a Michigan uniform. Now, in a lot of cases, they've not been asked to, right? But still, there's a lot. I mean, this is a recruiting profile all-star team, but I, uh, other than, you know, Aiden Hutchinson and a couple of other guys, I can't think of anybody that I think right now would be a surefire first team, all big 10 team, you know, when I do my own college football preview later this year, uh, then you throw in all of the new coaches. This is really a, to me, a referendum and reckoning on Jim Harbaugh's program from a, a coaching perspective, because I think that you and I would also agree that there's enough of those players on this team that we could probably name four or five coaches right now that we think could potentially be coaching at Michigan next year, that if they had this raw material to start with, could probably get eight to 10 wins out of this team, somewhere in there, with uh, the, the establishment of culture, player development, those sorts of, th- those sorts of things. So if they, if they can't do that with this team, if you're looking at losing to Michigan State and Mel Tucker another year, you're going to lose after never losing to Indiana for 40 years, you lose to them for a second year in a row, right? Those are the, those are the games that are going to decide. You can lose to both Penn State and Ohio State. Uh, and still get to eight to 10 wins. You know, Washington is early in the year. That's a team that won the Pac-12 North last year, but it went three and one. It has a lot of question marks too. And and still kind of a, a rookie coach in Jimmy Lake because there wasn't much of an off season last year. I guess my point is there's a lot of winnable games on this schedule for a coaching staff that knows how to mold this raw material into a team. And then there's a lot of those kinds of games, though, that are very losable for a coaching staff that doesn't. I I really think this year, because of the makeup of the roster, it it really is a reckoning on whether Jim Harbaugh, they've they've made every change. They've changed. They've swapped out coordinators on both sides in the last couple of years. Now they've done the Brian Kelly 2016 reboot. Hell, we just, uh, you know, threw out our recruiting coordinator last week and are bringing in a new guy that that's exactly what Kelly did after the four and eight of 2016. So if it doesn't work this fall, if they can't at least get to eight wins, then I think, you know, that 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 is your sure verdict. Now, I'm already there. I think he should have been let go last year, but there's no way around that reckoning, I think, this year. I think you get it one way or the other, Mark. Steve, I also think that we're entering a time between the end of spring practice and the beginning of August camp that's going to possibly have more activity than at any time in college football history for two reasons. Number one, the dead period is going to end at the end of May, and I know that this doesn't affect this football season, but as we go forward, of course, this program – And uh, so I don't have this statistically confirmed, but there should be less commits uh, to date than there typically are in a college football calendar. Therefore, once the campuses are open on June 1st, all these schools are announcing these big weekends that they're having in June that they would have had earlier. So there are going to be more players and currently are on the table to, to, to be committed to a school than ever before. So we're going to see more recruiting activity in the early summer than we ever have, number one. Number two, because of this transfer portal that was humming for the six weeks after the season that's died down, I wouldn't be surprised if it churns back up because now that we're through spring practice, again, a lot of teams are going to play this weekend and then a few uh, the first weekend of May. Guys are going to assess their situation. Yeah, you're going to know where you're okay, right. uh, Yeah, I thought I was in better shape on this depth chart a month ago, but apparently I'm not. So I'm going to weigh my options and and possibly leave. So this transfer portal may start churning here in the next uh, six weeks as well. Those are good points. Let's look at the Big Ten now as a whole coming out of spring practice. What are some of the key questions around the conference that you're taking a look at? I'm going to start obvious with Ohio State, the three-man quarterback battle. Uh, Kyle McCord's got the best arm talent. He's the um, quarterback out of uh, Philadelphia. But um, C.J. Stroud's the best prepared. Now, 
everybody focuses on the spring game and that's what we get to see, but let's not overemphasize the spring game because again, it's one of 15 sessions. It's one of about three to four scrimmages. We just get to watch that one. Uh, but if that's any indication, Stroud's the guy for the job right now. And I think Ryan Day, I'm conjecturing that he clearly that he doesn't know who his guy is. I'm sure he favors one, but Stroud seems to be the guy that's best in charge of the offense and has both the run and the pass covered to be a capable Ohio State quarterback. But Steve, the the quarterback competition that I'm going to enjoy is not within one team. It's trying to determine who is going to come out of the Western Division between Iowa and Wisconsin because I think a lot of people that didn't necessarily follow Wisconsin football through the season, we were all taken aback by the Graham Mertz off the Jack Cone injury. He comes in 20 for 21, five touchdown passes that first game against Illinois. He's a five-star. Wisconsin finally has a dynamic quarterback, and he said he's the guy. Uh, Spencer Petras on the other side it was at uh, Iowa – played a poor couple games, and he got better. And if anything, Mertz, after that first game, two touchdowns and five picks, mm -hmm. sub-60% the rest of the season. Spencer Petras outplayed him head-to-head, -head, played much better down the stretch. Iowa won that game 28-7. to So where Graham Mertz has the name, Iowa-Wisconsin at quarterback could be uh, advantage Iowa, which is a bit unexpected. So, and, and also Wisconsin more unsettled at running back than they typically are. They usually have the Monte Ball, Melvin Gordon type back there, but uh, Garrett Groshek and Nikia Watson both left. Uh, Jalen Berger's uh, an exceptional talent. Uh, Michigan fans may remember him. He yeah, ran he's a for big about, time recruit uh, for them. Yeah. Yeah. 85, 90 yards against you guys last year. Uh, he missed a lot of spring because of a leg injury. I don't think it's serious, uh, but uh, Wisconsin thin it running back and Mertz didn't show capable of shouldering the load as that dynamic guy that we've never seen a quarterback other than Russell Wilson for one season at Wisconsin. So I, I like that quarterback comparison in the big 10 Western division. So that would be one spot to go. I think the West is fascinating. Um, you've got uh, you've got Jeff Brom there, who came in with so much fanfare, turned down the alma mater because he thought he was really building something at Purdue. They've hit a wall there. He may be coaching for his job this fall, and they've got a lot of guys back. It's just not a lot of them are impact players. Uh, you take a look at Illinois. I'm fascinated by Illinois. And I wonder if we are overlooking them. They were, remember, a bull team two years ago. Now, keep in mind that they they were second in the nation two years ago in non-offensive touchdowns. So, I mean, analytically, that was kind of a fluky six wins they got to. But you've got a sixth-year senior there at quarterback and Brandon Peters, who's seen it all, kind of comfortable in his own skin, knows what he is, knows what he isn't. They've still got several high-impact transfers there. You know, you got Luke Ford coming in, the transfer now, who's eligible at tight end. And you bring in a coach that has had as much success coaching in the Big Ten West as anybody has in the history of the Big Ten West and Brett Bielema. Uh, and he comes in, I'm guessing, he's always got some swag and chip on the shoulder. But, I mean, you're talking about a guy from a resume standpoint that has been that it has a better resume than a lot of guys that have gotten hired at jobs over him in the last few years. And he's made it no secret after what happened to Arkansas, he wanted to get back in the game. You know, you know Brett Bielema is coming in here with maximum ego. And a lot of these guys were in a bowl game two years ago. It's not a culture starting from nothing, right? And you look across the landscape of that division, I don't see a team right now I think is the definitive favorite. The team that we know is the top 10 team, and then after that, who knows? I just kind of think this division's wide open, and I think we're maybe, I mean, look what Northwestern did, okay? They went from 1-8, and eight, they went 8-1, and one, and then 1-8, and eight, and then back to first place in the division again. I, I wonder if we're overlooking Illinois and Brett Bielema in year one, where maybe year two or three, where some of the seniors on this team graduate and then the recruiting weakness, kind of you have hit a lull there in the roster. But maybe this year with the amount of guys they're bringing back and the fact that a lot of them won games two years ago, maybe the timing is right for him to make a little, at least some some form of a splash. I had the Illinois spring game on last night just to hear Brett Bielema talk. I love having Brett Bielema <laughs> back in the Big Ten. 
He, he's going to say something throughout the season, whether it's leading into a game or the post-game news conference. He's going to say some things that are just going to be fun to hear. Uh, he's just that kind of engaging, charismatic type. He also says that he learned from his stint in the NFL with the Giants and Patriots, that he had to combine the old school that he so much loves versus the way to do it now. And we'll see if that plays out on the field. But I love having Brett Bielema back. And I think that people would be a bit surprised to know because college football seems as though the structure is so stagnant in terms of the power structure that I've run the numbers a few years, Steve, in regards to how many teams either improve or decline by at least three games in a college football season. And you'd be surprised how many across the the landscape of the power five, because it seems like, oh, a handful, but it's been between 19 and 23, not looking at uh, this season is going to be difficult to judge because of course of the truncated season, you can't compare records. Uh, But in the three previous seasons, four to five teams in the big 10, either increase or decrease their win total by at least three. And maybe Illinois is a candidate. Hmm. Uh, another team that I think will be uh, fascinating. Well, I, I think the entire division is fascinating. Is it a make or break year for Scott Frost? I don't think it's a, a make or break year necessarily, but uh, I think the next season will be the make or break year. I think he's going to get a, a bit of a pass coming off. Uh, 2020, but uh, I just felt as though he was the perfect guy for the job for all the reasons that we've cited in in the past. And um, he's recruited well. Adrian Martinez is going to be the guy at quarterback once again. Uh, they bring in Marquis Step from USC. Otherwise, they they have avoided running back. They lay, they lost uh, Wandale Robinson, uh, one of the premier playmakers. See, in that's the, the issue. He would have had three or four top 25 classes in a row there. He can't, this is the problem we're having here at the old Block M, he can't retain guys. You know, Michigan, I think, is eighth of an all-power five teams of transfers in the last four or five years. And like most of the other programs uh, around us have had coaching changes, which is the number one reason guys go to the transfer portal. He's struggling to retain players. I mean, Wandale Robinson, the name you just mentioned, that's not the only example. But he's the most glaring one because he was an established star on the team. And they just took his ball and went home. That's that's one thing. I mean, they, they come in through the outdoor there uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska. He's having a hard time keeping that culture together. I wasn't necessarily concerned with that for the first year, year and a half, because you figure, OK, yeah, a lot of it's the dead losing. weight from the old staff. Right. Yeah. yeah get rid of the yeah. dead weight. Get rid of the, the guys. But it's it's that continued with his own it. guys now. That's it the issue. It has continued. Yeah. Yep. Mark, great stuff as always, man. Always appreciate talking to you, and uh, we'll do it again soon. All right, take care. Thanks so much, Steve. You bet. A big thank you to our Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast because you make these episodes possible with your support. And we get asked all the time, hey, we love what you guys do. How can we support you? Well, for just $5 a month, you can support us at patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast. And hey, college basketball may be done, but now we're into the Major League Baseball handicapping and we had an outstanding season in Major League Baseball last year. We had a pretty good season in college basketball this year as well, as you can see right there from something we recently posted on our Patreon page. So five Five dollars a month to get some pretty good sports handicapping, an opportunity to win some money, like when we recommended you take before the tournament, Baylor six to one to win the national championship. You saw that thing pay off, right? Well, your five dollars a month pays off when you support us at patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast. This week's Twitter poll results, we asked you how big of an advantage did Michigan gain over the rest of college football by not televising a spring game. 61.3% of you got the right answer. Only dumbasses claim this. 16.9% of you got the acceptable answer. No advantage whatsoever. And I'm hoping that at least 99% of the 21.8% that said we can beat Bama now did so sarcastically. Although... After paying attention to what's been going on in this place called America the last couple of years, I am not so sure. That brings us to the feedback of the week from Jamal Green, who says, Can we now acknowledge 
that there's something systemically wrong with the program, please. It's being stripped mined down to the stumps of all its resources, and we're going to call this a reboot in year seven. Come on now. Yes, Jamal, you're right. And, of course, now we got rid of the recruiting coordinator as well. With the uh, and, and just in time for recruiting to be allowed in person again. Why not bring in somebody totally brand new that hasn't talked to any of the recruits whatsoever, has got a month to get up to speed? Why not? I mean, why not? Harbaugh, Harbaugh, Harbaugh. We're just doing random acts of Harbaugh, Jamal. There is no plan. There is no vision. There's just an enthusiasm unknown to mankind or something. It's just random acts of Harbaugh. That, that's all that we do. We hire a quarterback's coach after spending two years recruiting a five-star quarterback. We hire a quarterback coach like five minutes before spring ball starts. All right. Right after the NCAA says you can recruit in person and we're trying to bring all these guys in in June when the weather's beautiful in Michigan, why not get rid of the recruiting coordinator who's been working with these families for the last few months and go to somebody totally brand new that nobody knows who over the last 10 years has spent seven of them selling medical devices or something. Why not? I mean, why not? Just random acts of Harbaugh, Jamal. That's all we do. Unfortunately, brother, your name's Jamal Green and not Ward Manuel. So we're stuck with another lost year of random acts of Harbaugh. Unfortunately. That'll do it for this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. Don't forget, like, rate, subscribe, five-star review, whichever the case may be on and, and whichever platform you utilize, whether it's uh, YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, Stitcher Google Play, et cetera. Uh, please keep doing those things, sharing the links to these episodes with other Michigan fans you know so that we can connect with them too. Also, don't forget to follow us on Twitter. In between episodes, at Michigan Podcast to keep up to date on all things we think maize and blue. Until the next time, I'm Steve Dace. Over. Over.